is a, a new functional group or group of functional groups. Um, these will be groups that contain alcohols, um, phenols, and ethers. So basically all of these groups contain oxygens. So here are our learning objectives. Um, we're actually going to do this all in one video today um, simply because it doesn't help us to break this up into smaller pieces. So this will be a little bit longer. Um, but as we mentioned, these are other functional groups. Up until now we've done alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, aromatic groups, um, which were all hydrocarbons. So they pretty much only contained hydrogen and carbon. Now we're going to start looking at other functional groups. Um, today's functional groups contain oxygens in them. So we have hydroxyl groups. We've seen the hydroxyl before. This is one of our polyatomic ions. Um, and when we see an OH group, we're going to start calling these alcohols. So there are many more alcohols than just the one that you get at a bar, um, but that is one of them. So a compound in which we have an OH group attached to an aliphatic carbon, um, we will write the general formula as ROH. So this is just some sort of aliphatic carbon. Remember, aliphatic means that it's not aromatic. We have a different name for OH groups that are connected to aromatic rings. We call these phenols. And lastly, we're going to talk about ethers. Ethers are going to be oxygens that are sandwiched between two carbons. And now there could be very long chains on either side, or it could just be this, but it does have to be an oxygen sandwich. So here's some examples. Here's an alcohol. This is ethanol. This is menthol. Now this is aliphatic. This is not aromatic. There's, even though there's the cyclical ring here, we don't see that alternating double bond pattern. And then here's an example of another alcohol. Okay, so these are all alcohols. Um, yes, even the um, biological compound cholesterol ends in O-all. So they all have the same ending. These are all alcohols, O-L. So when we're naming our alcohols, um, just like we've done before, we're going to find the longest chain. But now instead of it having the longest chain with like a double bond or a triple bond in it, it has to be the longest chain in which the OH group is attached to that carbon. So um, we're going to add um, that longest chain together. So if it's five, that would be pent, right? And now instead it's going to be pentanol. So we're going to add OL to the end of it. The number of the longest chain, we want to give the OH carbon, whichever one the OH is attached to, the lowest number possible. So that will dictate which way we number. And then we locate where, which carbon, uh, we call, call it out in the name, which carbon the OH group is on. So for example, this is 3 hexanol. So if we have any other extra groups on there, we're going to name those just like as we always done with our prefixes. Again, trying to have the lowest numbering possible. Um, so here we have 2,4-dimethylhexanol. We have a chain of 6 as our longest that contains the carbon with the OH group. And when we have that 6, that means that these two methyl groups up here weren't accounted for. And they're on the 2 and 4 carbon. And we have two of them that are the same group. So this would be dimethyl. So 2,4-dimethyl-3-hexanol. Just like we had dienes and trienes when we had multiple double bonds or, double, or multiple triple bonds, when we have multiple OH groups, like two OH groups, that would be a diol. If we had three OH groups, that would be a triol. So instead of having just all at the end here, it would be diol. Now, when we name our phenols, it's a little different. We've already kind of talked about this when we talked about our aromatic compounds. We know that OH on an aromatic benzene ring on its own is just called a phenol. That then if we have another substituent on there, we can name this as 4-bromophenol. You could also do para-bromophenol with that as well. Um, remember the ortho-meta-para designation. And then lastly, here we have multiple, multiple groups, 2, 4, 6, tribromophenol. Now remember, when we have this uh, OH group on our benzene ring, this is always the number one position. So can you name the following two compounds? We have methanol, because this is one carbon, so methanol. And now we have two carbons here, and we have two hydroxyl groups. 
So for our second one, the longest chain is two carbons, making it ethan ethanodiol, okay? So diol coming from the fact that we have two OH groups and the F coming from the two carbon groups. We also call this company, compound ethylene glycol, which is a common name for it, not the IUPAC name. Which of the following uh, is the common name for this compound? This is what we call it, T-butyl or tert-butyl alcohol. Again, I really encourage you to be doing your reading. You have to go through and learn the different ways that we have for our iso, our propyl, um, our sec-butyl, our tert-butyl, all those different formations you do need to know. Um, so please go do your reading. If you have a question, ask me. I'm happy to help answer them during office hours. If m cresol is also known as 3-methylphenol, which of the following is most likely o cresol So again, here you need to identify um, what O would be. So in that case, it would be ortho, which would be 1-2 positioning. Now, alcohols come in a few different flavors. We call them primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols, depending on what's going on in the carbon that the OH is attached to. So this can be a little complicated. When we say primary, you should be thinking about one. What we're saying is the carbon that the OH is attached to only has one other thing that is not hydrogen attached to it. A secondary uh, oxid, or excuse me, a secondary alcohol, the carbon that is attached to the OH has two non-hydrogen groups attached to it. And lastly, a tertiary alcohol is an alcohol where the carbon attached to the OH group has three non-hydrogens around it. The other way you can memorize this is tertiary means the carbon has no hydrogens, secondary means the carbon has one hydrogen, and primary means the carbon has two hydrogens. So here's some of your examples of those primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. So from the previous slide, we asked you to describe the, the compound um, so we're looking at rubbing alcohol, how would you best describe it? It's a secondary alcohol. So if we look back here, isopropyl alcohol is rubbing alcohol. This is it right here. It is a secondary alcohol. The following molecule is a tertiary alcohol. There are no hydrogens on the carbon attached to the OH group. So, in terms of physical properties, when we're talking about alcohols, one thing we can look at is their solubilities. Now, OH groups are polar, so you may be going, oh, alcohols must be uh, soluble in water. And you would be correct to a certain extent. Um, as our CH chain, right, the number of carbons in the molecule increases, the polarity from that one little OH group is not going to be able to be substantial enough to increase the solubility. So we know that linear alkanes, right, are hydrocarbons, they're not soluble in water at all. We know that. Um, but what we can see here is that we get from one butanol, one pentanol, hexanol, to heptanol, we start seeing number of carbons, the solubility starts decreasing. So around one pentanol, by the time we get to one hexanol, which would be um, six carbons in the compound, we're at very little solubility. And by seven carbons in the compound, no solubility at all. So this gets back to our concepts of intermolecular forces, ER, intermolecular forces. If you don't remember what an intermolecular force is, you're going to have to go back and review that from unit two and one. When we talk about the solubility of these alcohols, we're looking at this hydrogen bonding, that intermolecular force, hydrogen bonding that occurs between the OH of the hydroxyl group in the alcohol and the H2O itself. So like we were saying, the larger and longer the chain of hydrocarbons are in an alcohol, right, this is all one molecule here, the less um, the hydrogen bonding from just this one little polar group uh, will have effect on the whole overall molecule. So something like this, even though this hydrogen bonding occurs, all this is also occurring, and therefore it is not very soluble. When we have smaller um, 
smaller alcohols like ethanol here, these uh, hydrogen bonds will have an effect and be able to make this more soluble. We also know that more hydrogen bonding that can occur, the higher the boiling point, right? So alcohols, they can make a little bit of hydrogen bonding, so they're definitely going to have higher boiling points than our alkanes and alkenes. And that's what we see here, primary alcohols. They have higher boiling points in our alkanes, and we'll talk about ethers in a little bit, but that's because our alkanes are nonpolar, which means they only have London dispersion forces, right? Those intermediate or those instantaneous dipole moments. So their boiling points are relatively low compared to alcohols, which are capable of hydrogen bonding. So which of the following will most likely have the highest boiling point? Butanol. Very good. Which alcohols experience hydrogen bonding with water? All of these. All alcohols, if it has an OH group, will be able to hydrogen bond with water. Oops, put the answer on this first page anyway. So again, the question here was for you to determine which would be the most soluble. So we're looking for the one that would be the most soluble in water. So the one that has polar bonds and is the smallest. We're going to talk about some reactions with alcohols now. So we talked reactions with our alkenes and our alkynes and our aromatic compounds. Now we're going to talk about some reactions with our alcohols. So we did hydration reactions. We did hydration reactions in alkenes and alkynes. We're going to do dehydration reactions with alcohols. So if a hydration reaction was adding water, a dehydration reaction is going to be the elimination of water. And when we eliminate that water, we're going to produce an alkene. So this is the opposite of what we saw before. Remember when we could take alkenes and hydrate them and make alcohols? When we take an alcohol and dehydrate it, we make an alkene. So that's what we see having uh, happen here. So here's an alcohol, just a standard alcohol, and we have highlighted in blue HOH. This is the water that we're going to remove. When these two are removed, these carbons now need to make an extra bond. So they'll bond with each other, forming this alkene. An example of this would be if we take 2-propanol, which is a primary alcohol, excuse me, yeah, and we're going to... Um, uh, dehydrate it, we're going to produce the alkene. Now, you may be going, uh, the CH3 is over here and there's a CH3 over here. How do I know that the double bond doesn't happen over here? Well, we need to talk about what is most likely to happen. In 2-propanol, it's symmetric, so it doesn't matter if the double bond happened on this side or this side. It would be the same compound. But let's look at the example we have down here. This is a non-symmetrical compound, right? We have one, two, three, four um, carbons, so this is going to be, be a butanol, so we're going to have two butanol. Two butanol, they could either have the hydrogen from down here to make the water or the hydrogen from down here to make water. So which one is it going to do? Most likely we'll make two butene as the most. Um, <clears throat> we want to have two carbon groups on the double bond, where if we make one butene, this is less stable. Okay, so you want, when you make your double bond for your dehydration, you're going to want to put it more towards the center. Um, more towards the center will be more stable, be more of the product that would form. Some of this will form, but not nearly as much as this. Dehydration reactions happen all the time within our body and are part of things like the citric acid cycle. We will see more of this when we get to our biochem section, but again, I just want to show you, this is an enzyme that does this process where it removes water to form an alkene. Now, if you look at this compound, we see that this is cis because we have these two groups down here are the same when we look across the double bond. So, again, I won't be asking you reaction mechanisms, but I do have it here if you want to look through the process of how this reaction actually occurs. So when we have an alcohol and we dehydrate it with another alcohol, we're going to produce an ether. So this is our third um, functional group that we're going to be talking about. So when two alcohols come together, we have highlighted here, we have HOH. When two alcohols come together, we make that sandwich oxygen, that ether. 
So when we have an ether, we can actually figure out what alcohols it came from. In this case, this is pretty easy. We have ethanol and ethanol, which means we would just kind of cut this in half and go, okay, if I, this was my oxygen on my alcohol, this would be ethanol. And if I look on this side, this would also be ethanol. But I can figure out who the parents are of these ethers. So we call this diethyl ether. Diethyl, because there's two ethyl groups, and we call out the sandwich oxygen by saying ether. So alcohols can also be oxidized. We haven't talked about aldehyde and ketones yet, so don't worry too much about it right now. Um, but we do want to talk about what's going on in alcohol oxidation. When alcohols lose hydrogen atoms, they will be oxidized. And this can happen with what we call an oxidizing agent. Right? We know when we did our redox reactions, we would call out which one is the oxidizing agent, which one is the reducing agent, so on and so forth. Uh, and a lot of times when you see a chemical reaction, we'll just put a general O in parentheses like this to represent the oxidizing agent. So if we have a primary alcohol, again, an alcohol where the a, uh, carbon connected to the OH has two hydrogens on it and only one R group, a primary alcohol plus an oxidizing agent will yield a aldehyde. This could be further oxidized to carboxylic acid. So the important thing here is we can see that we lose the H from up here and we lose an H from down here. These are the H's plus this O that make the water. So when this happens, when this H uh, is lost from the O, he wants to make uh, an additional bond and when this H is lost from the, um, the carbon he wants to make a double bond so we end up with this structure here this C double bond O is called a carbonyl group and it comes up in a bunch of different types of functional groups so having a carbonyl um, does not determine what functional group it is but there's a whole class of functional groups that have carbonyls in them aldehydes carboxylic acids and ketones all have this carbonyl group in them. So primary alcohols will make aldehydes, which can further make carboxylic acids. Secondary alcohols, where they have two R groups and only one hydrogen, can only make what we call a ketone. So we'll talk more about the distinction of aldehydes, ketones, and carboxylic acids in a little bit, but it's basically following what was given to you in the reactants and just getting rid of the pieces around it. Tertiary alcohols don't oxidize at all. There's no, R, there's no additional H group here to go make water. We have an H here, we have an O here. There's no other H group for us to go make H2O. So tertiary, al tertiary alcohols will never oxidize. Here's an example of uh, an alcohol oxidation. We have ethanol plus um, a strong oxidizing agent, which means we're going to take this H, this O and one of these H's, and we make acetyl aldehyde. Here is that aldehyde plus water. We can oxidize this again, where we take um, <clears throat> an additional H plus our oxidizing agent and the H over here, and we get acetic acid. Okay? Um, <clears throat> this is a carboxylic acid. So again, here's two propanol. This is a um, secondary alcohol. And here's the H, two H's and the O that remove to make water to make the ketone acetone. So here is our kind of roadmap of all the different types of reactions that can be done with alcohols. So alcohols with acid and will dehydrate and get rid of water. And we know that if we have two alcohols, they can dehydrate to form an ether. If we have a uh, just a alcohol that is dehydrated on its own, we're going to make the alkene. If we want oxidation to occur, we need a strong oxidizer. And then we know if we're primary, we make aldehydes, which can further be oxidized to carboxylic acids, secondaries to ketones, tertiaries, no oxidation occurs. Now we're starting to get um, enough understanding of these functional groups to be able to start doing multi-step processes. So most alcohols don't naturally um, occur in their com commercial quantities and are prepared from alkenes. So most alcohols that we use in a laboratory or industrial purposes don't really exist naturally like that in the quantities that we would need them. So we make them from the alkenes. 
Um, and this is a very common process. So when we have these multi-step processes, we're going to start looking at things like this. You will have to do this on your tests and quizzes. You will have to be able to come up with a reasonable explanation for how we got from this to this. And it requires multiple steps. The hint here is to always try and go from the product and back to the reactants. Working backwards is a little easier. So we're going to go through it in this um, general um, step. So if we were starting with this, here we see that carbonyl group. This is a ketone. So what makes ketones? Ketones are made from secondary alcohols with strong oxidizers. So here's our secondary alcohol and our strong oxidizer. This was the step right before the final product. When I was here, how could I get to the starting material that was provided to me? I have an alcohol and I have to go to an alkene. I know to go from an alkene to an alcohol, I have to hydrate it. So there are two steps to this overall process, right? We started with this and we ended it with this. And we had to have these intermediate steps occur. You will have to come up with your own ideas of how you would get from a product to a reactant. This is one of the more challenging parts of organic chemistry. Typically, this is where students struggle. I would encourage you to look at these more like puzzles um, and, and take them with that kind of attitude. Can you answer it? Tertiary alcohols do not oxidize, so they will not have any reaction. We will dehydrate, and then when we dehydrate uh, this alcohol, we will have an alkene form. Try and name the alkene that is formed from this compound. So we want to talk a little bit about some important alcohols that actually exist in our um, day-to-day uh, -day lives. So methyl alcohol is also known as wood alcohol, which is CH3OH. This is a very common solvent um, used in laboratories and things like that. Um, it's also used as a fuel in race cars and can be highly toxic. So methanol is not something you want to drink. This is not something you get at a bar. It can cause death, blindness, highly toxic. Ethanol. This is the alcohol that if you are 21, you have probably imbibed at a bar. Um, ethanol is also known as grain alcohol. Commercially, we make it through ethylene, so that alkene, and bio biologically, it's made through fermentation of carbohydrates, right? So if you brew beer or something like that, that's how ethanol is formed um, biologically. In a lab, typically, we take ethylene and we hydrate it. Um, it's used as a solvent. It's a starting material for a lot of industrial um, materials. It's mildly toxic. Um, this is why you can sometimes get sick and have alcohol poisoning. So here's that laboratory way that we go about making ethanol. Um, here's ethylene, and we hydrate it to get ethanol. And in uh, a biological process, we use glucose, which is found in grains, sugars, things like that, Yeast is going to be um, the biological enzyme that will turn the glucose into ethanols. We also produce um, some CO2 as well in that process. Other important alcohols include 2-propanol, which is isopropyl alcohol, and 1-2-3-propotriol, uh, which is glycerol. Um, this is found in a lot of foods, soaps, things like that. Um, ethylene, 1,2-ethylene uh, diol, also known as ethylene glycol. This is antifreeze that goes into your car. Um, propylene glycol, or 1,2-propanol diol, is a, another important industrial product. So here are some examples of um, important alcohols that we use in our day-to-day -day lives. So um, from here we can talk about phenols and phenol reactions uh, and their properties. So we know a little bit that these are aromatic compounds. Um, however, we want to talk about them in a little more detail. Uh, typically, phenols will be lower in melting point um, and have kind of a medicinal odor to them. Um, kind of smells like how medicines and cough drops and things like that taste and smell. Please don't taste it. Um, they behave as a weak acid in water, so you should remember by our bronsted lari definition of what a, an acid does, and they react with bases to form salts. 
So with a base, we form this salt. Um, <clears throat> phenols can be uh, disinfectant when they're in a dilute solution, so um, they're also useful in terms of like medical uh, um, applications as well. Um, so here are um, some disinfectants that are used to spray in hospitals and homes and things like that that are based off of phenols. Phenols also are part of antioxidants in foods. Um, <clears throat> again, some of these names are pretty long, but you should be able to go through and identify all the portions of this name. So which of the following um, will react with a phenol to produce a salt? So the, here you have to remember what reacts with phenols to make salts. Strong bases. The last group we're going to talk about in these slides are ethers. Ethers, remember we're talking about that sandwich oxygen that comes from the dehydration of two alcohols. Um, there are common names um, with these um, ethers, but we also have the um, IUPAC naming system as well. So ethers can be linear, like we've been seeing, but they can also exist in a chain, in a cycle, like we see here. So these we call a heterocyclic ring. Hetero meaning different, cyclic ring. There are different kinds of atoms in this ring. They're not all carbons like we've seen. Now there's an oxygen in the ring as well, so this is a heterocyclic ring. Sometimes we'll see nitrogens or sulfurs in rings as well. This is a furan ring, this is a pyran ring. We'll see more of these when we get to our biological systems when we talk about carbohydrates um, as well as some of the amino acids. So what is the name of this molecule, this ether? What is the name of this ether? This is ethyl isobutyl ether. Ethyl isobutyl ether. So um, even though ethers contain oxygen groups, they're not going to be as polar as alcohols because remember, the polarity of an alcohol comes from the fact that we have an OH group. These uh, oxygen-containing compounds are bound to other carbons. So we're going to have um, less polarity there. We're also going to be less soluble in water. Um, they're going to be more soluble than our hydrocarbons, but they're going to be less soluble than alcohols. That's because um, these uh, have very limited hydrogen bonding capability. Um, that's also why they have lower boiling points in alcohols, because again, no ability to hydrogen bond with itself. They're highly flammable as well. So hydrogen bonding of dimethyl ether and water. Ethers can hydrogen bond with water. Ethers cannot hydrogen bond with themselves. This is important. You should, on a test or a quiz, be able to explain to me why and how that occurs. Why is it that ethers are capable of hydrogen bonding with water, but there's no hydrogen bonding between an ether and another ether? Ethers do not tend to go under any of these types of reactions. They're very stable. They don't want to do a whole lot. Um, they do go through combustion reactions, but that's about it. A little side note I want to talk about are thiol groups. We won't really see thiol groups until, uh, again, until we get to our biological chemistry section, but I just want to bring it up now since we're talking about them. We call them thiols. So unlike an alcohol, we call it a thiol, and the thi portion of this comes from the fact that it's a sulfur. Um, if you look on a periodic table, the O is right uh, underneath the R er, over the S, so they have the same number of uh, valence shell electrons. They behave very similarly. So a lot of the things we see happen with oxy uh, the oxygen containing alcohols will also occur with our thiols. Typically, um, these have a very strong like onion type uh, smell to them. Uh, garlic, onion, all of these have thiol-containing compounds and then these sulfur-containing compounds. Um, the smell that is associated with a skunk also is a sulfur-containing compound, so they're pretty strong smells. Here's what a thiol looks like, um, and here is this disulfide bridge. We'll see more of this disulfide interactions when we get to our biochemistry. 
Um, for right now, I won't be testing you on your ability to do the reactions of thiols. We will be doing these reactions when we get to biochemistry. I just want to introduce them now. <clears throat> so the scent of the skunk is primarily caused by the thiol. Um, chemical reactivity that closest aligns with this ether. So again, remember ethers, they're not very reactive. What else is not very reactive? Alkanes. Disulfide is formed when thiol undergoes oxidation. All right, which is the major product? We have this combination of our thiols coordinating with a metal. And we'll talk more about this when we get to our biological section. Which of the following contains a hydroxyl group? Remember, hydroxyl is the OH. Alcohols contain a hydroxyl group. So the last thing we want to start talking about in this section is the concept of a polyfunctional group. What happens when we have one or, or two or more functional groups in a compound? It's totally possible to have, uh, like we have here, we've got an OH group here, so we have an alcohol. I see a whole bunch of alkane happening here. I see a whole bunch of alcohols here, but then I also see an aldehyde here. So I've got a lot of different functionality on it. We'll see this a lot, especially when we get to our carbohydrates. It's important that you read in your textbook about how we name these compounds. Please take the time to read how we name polyfunctional compounds. If you have questions about it, I'm more than happy to answer them during office hours. So cholesterol um, is one of these groups where we have a lot of different functionality going on. We have an alcohol, we have an alkene, we've got all sorts of crazy cyclic structures to it. Um, here's an example of a vitamin E molecule where we have alcohols, we have a benzene ring, we have a, um, a heterocyclic ring here, right? This is an ether that's in a cycle. We have these long hydrocarbon chains here. So lots and lots of times what will end up happening is we will have functional groups um, <clears throat> that we have multiple different kinds of functional groups within one molecule. So here is um, <clears throat> THC from marijuana, the active ingredient in marijuana, and I'd like you to go through and identify all the different functional groups that you see. So ideally you caught that we have um, ethers, phenolic or OH groups, a benzene ring, and a carbon-carbon double bond. This is the end of chapter 13. There's a lot of information in here to cover. It's really important that you go through and read your text. It's also important that you start working on the online homework as well as looking at the extra help worksheets. Please let me know if you have any questions and please feel free to email me.